Good afternoon, Paul. It's Tuesday, the 7th of February. Here's the heads up brief for today. For the Southeast Asia production, we covered 20 issues. For North Asia, we covered six. And for the Australasia and Pacific Islands, we covered nine issues. In South Asia, we covered 16 issues, plus the major issues in the Europe, Middle East, and Africa region. Okay, wonderful busy day for Australasia and the Pacific Islands. Quite uncanny. I'm sure there'll be some interesting discussions there. Thanks. Go ahead. Right. Uh, start off with Indonesia, where there's heightened security in East Java in Sido Aljo. Uh, the Nahdlatul Ulama, which is one of the world's largest um, Islamic organizations, is holding its uh, 100th anniversary event there. President Jokowi went to visit earlier in the day, and several high-profile pr politicians and leaders will be going throughout the day. Okay, wonderful. Just to get the pronunciation on that, Nahdlatul Ulama. But go ahead, mate. In Papua, a Susi airplane uh, was on fire at the Enduga airstrip earlier today. Right now, we don't have confirmation whether this was an attack or an accident. This is an area where the West Papua National Liberation Army is active in the highlands. Yeah, look, that's PPNB central. Most of the, the nut pots in the TPNPB are indeed from the Enduga tribe. Um, I've been reading some Bahasa feeds that have come to me and it does appear that there was a TPNPB activity. Interestingly, I was talking to an insurance underwriter that studies a lot of these incidences and he noted that Susi Air, given some financial issues plus electing to operate in the highlands of Papua, is uninsured. So uh, we'll monitor it. Well, I'm, though the the Bahasa versions of the reports I'm getting says there's TPNPB involvement, they could have also been false claims. So we'll sit back and, and piece that together in the next day or two. Thank you. Right. In Australia, the New South Wales government announced a freeze on mining royalty rates. This is in response to the government's imposition of price caps on coal uh, until June 2024. Yeah, okay. Um, no shortage of lobbyists there working with governments in the Australian end. They have the integrity of the great train robber. Go ahead. Uh, China resumed all travel to Macau and Hong Kong yesterday, relaxing the COVID controls in place. So there's 100% back to normal now, is it? Yes, that's what the reports are indicating so far. Well, thank you. Uh, in Timor-Leste, President Jose Ramos Horta confirmed that uh, he will announce the date of the legislative elections on the 13th of February. Okay, that's interesting. So just just under a week uh, next Monday, because they they have to be held before May. I noticed Ramos Horta made some very interesting comments um, yesterday, and that's basically that um, he wants Parliament and therefore um, the Timor Gap, which is 56% shareholder in the actual Greater Sunrise resource, to sit back and wait until the elections. The Timorese, the Timorese Timor Gap's a state-owned company which owns roughly, I think it's about 56% of that um, consortium, the other operators, or the operator is Woodside Energy, which has a 33% stake, and another company um, called Osaka Gas Australia, which owns 10%. And these are really interesting comments because Woodside has previously said it's impossible to technically move or distribute the gas to a plant on the north coast of Timor and the the trench, um, the, the the large sea trench, I think it's called the Timor Trough that runs off the north coast is technically debilitating. Now, the uh, three companies, Timor is Timor Gap, Operator Woodside Energy and Osaka Gas have basically said they're going to redo the analysis and the technical data using, you know, more modern methodologies I'm not sure how much they've changed in the last two years. But there's obviously a lot of political games going on Woodside. I mean, you probably elaborate more on their involvement in the great spying saga. But it's hard, given that, 
spying saga where they were caught bugging the Parliament's office during the Timorese Parliament's office during negotiations. It's hard for the Timorese to take anything that Woodside and the Australian government say on face value when they've been caught out to show, you know, what is really, you know, they were, it was a cumbersome and idiotic and inappropriate abuse of, of a new neighbour and a poor neighbour's share of a, of a critical resource. And so it's technically impossible. And then an independent consultant came out and said it's actually technically feasible. It's no one experts. Porter, of course, has been the president many times. He's trusted by pretty much both sides. Interestingly, um, he's now trying to uh, sway things in a manner that's best for Timor as the president how much he gets swayed by Australia is another issue. But this is a fascinating um, point um, and we need to look at it really, really closely because you know, typically Timor relies on about, you know, nigh on 90% of its GDP comes from um, the offshore fields and Horta knows better than anybody that that's critical to power stability, energy, and security in Timor-Leste. Back, back to you, mate. Right, Paul. Those, that, that was quite helpful. And just to add to what you were saying, uh, Zanana Guzma, who's a front runner for the next Prime Minister, Prime Minister of uh, Timor-Leste, he has been adamant on having the greater sunrise field in Timor. So if the government does go this way, then there will be more pressure in Australia. Well, yes, and, and look, I mean, so I think the presidential elections were last held last year. So the next presidential election is in, I think it's a five-year cycle, so it's 2027. We've got the parliamentary elections before May, because he wants them in power, I think you said, by September, October. Yep. And at the moment, there's a coalition of power. So the current... Parliament is a coalition of four parties, basically Fretland, um, a party called PLP, CNRT, and Quinto. Um, and roughly Fretland has 23 odd seats. CNRT has, CNRT's in opposition has 21. And then the PLP has eight, and Quinto and the Democratic Party have five each. So um, if we look at those parties, Janana Gusmel, is now the head of CNRT. Paul Matan Ruak, also a former president with PLP, who's part of the coalition. So between those two, they have, you know, potentially have got 29 seats. So I think it's going to be a very interesting um, election. And I think the forming of the next coalition in itself will be extremely critical. Um, obviously, Janana Gusmao and Karl Matan Ruach have a very, and, and Ramas Horta, all the, the Horta was the political guy abroad fighting for, at a political level for Timorese freedom from Indonesia, whereas um, Tor Matan Ruach and Janata Gusmao were both in the jungle fighting the Indonesians. But all three have power, all three are known to have conflicts between each other, but all three also have more than willing to shake hands and form coalitions for their political stability and for what's best for Timor Leste. They have varying degrees of wanting to fill their own pockets, and I won't go into that. Um, yeah. But yeah, so thanks, mate. Thanks for raising that to my attention. Thanks for all the contacts, Paul. That was very good. Um, moving over to the Solomon Islands, there's incoming reports of unrest in Malita. Um, yeah. The Premier, Daniel Sudiani. Uh, has been removed as the provincial premier. Tensions with Guadalcanal have escalated in recent years. In November 2021, there were riots. Yeah, look, this is this is a part, if we remember, there was the Ramsey peacekeeping mission. The conflict inside the Solomon Islands is always between the Malaitans and the, they're called the, um, the Guardi, the Guardians. So Guarda is the tribe that's around um, Honiara, which is the capital of the Solomon Islands. 
and then you've got Iron Bottom Sound, which called after all the shipwrecks through the all the naval um, battles led to a lot of um, ships on the bottom. Then you come over to the island of Malaita. Malaita's uh, uh, both have a similar population, if memory serves me correctly, sort of 140 to 160,000 each. Um, the problem is when they have conflicts, and of course all the resources and all the government funding is mainly in in Guadal and Honiara and the outlying the the outlying islands, Malaita being the, the most populous, but then you go all the way out to the nearest island is literally, you know, within eyesight of Bougainville, which is the PNG borders between that last island to the to the northwest of the Solomon Islands and then which is the far east of Papua New Guinea, the far southern eastern border of Papua New Guinea. When there's conflict between the Malaitans and the Guadals, what fundamentally happens is then they go and trash Chinese business and as a out as as a offloading to defect or deflect tensions away from that direct conflict. And of course this is particularly fascinating now because you've had Penny Wong and the merry men of um the the Labor government in Australia racing out there after China um, nearly secured um security and and government and economic pacts with Solomon Islands and Australia when did what they don't do very often and graced the Solomon Islanders with their presence and gave them briefs on security and why Australia is superior. But that adds another dimension that the Chinese are still lurking. And I think if you dig in, that premier that's been removed is a Malayan premier. I want to go to a um, basically a referendum to get freedom. And he was also, if I'm not mistaken, or day the guy that was the main supporter of um, a strong relationship with China and isolation from Australia. So there's no doubt behind this, Australia's acting with um, friendly members in Honiara to get, you know, their way like um, narcissistic neighbours. So it's going to be a fascinating scenario. But sadly, you know, after years of a Ramsey deployment, UN, but was typically Australian heavy, um, I think it's only a matter of time until we see a pear-shaped outcome there because Australia only really seems interested when it wants to be, which is very really, really so. China's still going to be playing there. Australia's always sort of playing there, but kind of sneaking through the jungle like an elephant with a with an Uzi on one hip and chucking grenades from above. And so it's plodding around with its usual spying and levels of diplomacy that are kind of like from a Team America cartoon. So but anyway, back to you, mate. All right, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so moving over to South Asia, uh, traders will protest across Pakistan next week. Uh, this is over the government's plan to impose a new tax regime to meet IMF conditions for a loan. Uh, the traders are concerned over livelihoods and they believe that the tax conditions will um, disproportionately affect the lower and middle classes of Pakistan. So this okay, what sort of tr yeah. what sort of traders are we talking about? Uh, Paul, these are unions of traders across different sectors, so not okay. Specific. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Right. Uh, in Bangladesh, the ruling party and the opposition party will both uh, rally across the country on the eleventh of February. Uh, there are likely to be clashes or some breakouts of violence. Okay. Thanks a lot. In the Europe, Middle East, and Africa region, in France, tensions over the pension reform uh, bill continue as the National Assembly started debate on it yesterday. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, the death toll from yesterday's earthquake in Turkey has reached nearly 4,500 people, uh, with over 15,000 people injured. Okay, great. Could you just get us a spot map on the exact location of the earthquake sent to me by one of the... Distribution yep. team, please. Yep. Sure, we'll do, Paul. That's Great, it thank for you. today. Anything else from you? No, not from me. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks.